Et en whisky, 3, 2, 1, stop Pour moi, je suis prêt à démarrer les moteurs. Tu vas démarrer en allant dit pour les moteurs. Alors pour le 1, c'est ok pour le 1. Welcome to Airbus. Welcome to the We Make It Fly Airbus podcast. I'm Jeff Burridge. And I'm Martin Aguera. In this series, we're bringing you the fascinating stories of the people that have played a part in making Airbus the extraordinary company that it is today. This edition takes us to the very beginning of Airbus. The story of Airbus began with a small number of pioneers who over 50 years ago had a dream of creating a trans-European aviation company that could compete against the American giants. And let's not forget the context here, Jeff, because I think a lot of people do. In those formative years, nobody believed that all those, you know, the various national players that we had, all of which were very capable producing fantastic aircraft, could unite and create a, a bond, a conglomerate that would rack up the world markets. It seemed like a fantasy. Yeah, you're right, Martin. The Europe at that time needed to be developed and an aerospace industry was what was seen as something that could really bring together the technology and technical capabilities that, that we had. But it took some pioneers that we had, both in the political and industrial environment, to bring that together. They had that vision. They were the ones that were convinced that against all odds, they could make it happen. So, Jeff, you've been out and about and you've met somebody who embodies this, the the origins of Airbus. Let's hear the tape. So today we're outside the original corporate headquarters of Airbus in Blagnac, just a short walk from the airport on what is now a very large site. And I'm very pleased to have with me as our guest today, Barbara Kratt, who's the former head of media relations and spent almost 40 years with the company and has the distinction of having one of a, a, a badge number 007, one of the original starter-uppers as Airbus was back then. Thank you for having me. Uh, when I'm here and standing here today, I j and think back of how it was when I started, uh, it's just incredible what we managed to achieve in all those years. We were really a very small startup, and the original building, which opened in uh, 70, January 74, was just that small part. It didn't look like that, it had been mod modified since, and it was for 250 people max. Uh, really a startup, everybody knew everybody, it was fantastic. It was a. And if we had said at the time, and if we, you had told me or anyone that we would reach that, nobody would have believed it. Okay, because what we're looking at is a quite corporate looking building with many extensions added to it since. And we're going to walk through now and see what's changed over the past years. So Barbara, are we now standing in the original corporate headquarters? Uh, we are in the original entrance, but it didn't look like that at all. The entrance was on the other side, and uh, all this has been completely refurbished, reorganized many years back. And um, you said there was around 200 or so people working at the time, and what sort of skills were they? Uh, essentially... Uh, the partners were in charge of the development of the production of uh, all these things and we were essentially looking at what is external and in particular all the commercial aspects but we had to build it from scratch because we didn't exist nobody knew airbus at the time it was incredible uh, everybody knew boeing lockheed douglas airbus what is that the Europeans had less than 10% of the world market. We did not exist. We had to fight for everything. So we're having a coffee, Barbara, in one of the, the very pleasant coffee areas that we have here. And I can hear many languages, French, Spanish, German, English, all around. And you must have been one of the pioneers in terms of representing that international diversity of the company. In a way, because when we started here, and that was one of the beauties, 
uh, I found working for Airbus as a native German, having been raised in France, uh, having now a French passport, but feeling like a European stateless because European st <laughs> passports didn't, don't ex the European nation doesn't exist. Uh, we were building, uh, in a way, we were building Europe at the time and getting them together. And it was the first time in a cooperation that you really had one single company in charge of managing the program. Those who launched the Airbus program, Roger Betay in particular, but also Henry Ziegler and also my father, Felix Kracht, they all realized we really have to integrate. And so we came to Toulouse, Uh, decided on between the French and the Germans one single language, namely the language of aviation, which is English. And uh, so we went and we had people uh, from France, from Germany, who had to communicate together in English. And it was a perfect training because <clears throat> it was a foreign language for both. They had different cultures. And they had to learn to understand each other, speaking a foreign language and with a different culture. And in a way, it was a mutual cultural cross-fertilization uh, because also you put into question what the other was doing and which seemed logical. We have done it like that before, it works. Why? Uh, it can be done differently. It can be done differently. Why should it be done differently? It worked. No, we want to challenge that. Why? Have a pro... And so you came up with better solutions each time because it was a built-in autocratic system uh, for the design for everything, but even in the rapport with people. These cultural challenges then also helped Airbus better understand, be more open when going to see clients because we were trained we were going to see airlines, different cultures. We were trained already internally to listen to others, to understand. And the nicest ever thing was in terms of cultural cross-fertilization. You have in French the word se débrouiller. It's something which I don't think the word exists in English and it does certainly not exist, the concept, in German. It means try to find out, to sort it out your own way. Uh, but you see, you need many words to explain the concept. And in French, in vulgar, very vulgar French, you say, sorry for the vulgar word, instead of se débrouiller, se démerder. Uh, and then one day you can hear a German say to another German colleague, démerdieren Sie sich. This is to, was to me the best example of cross cultural cross fertilization and getting to understand each other. Because This German guy had understood the concept and applied it to his <laughs> fellow citizens to say, find a solution, get it done. <laughs> Nothing was taken for granted. We were a startup. We had a young team. It was the younger ones who said, oh, it's an opportunity for me to come to Airbus and to make a career at Airbus. And so you had plenty of young people, dynamic, not already put into a mold of thinking, who were creative and uh, just going out and let's do it, let's do it, let's do it. And that can-do spirit, I mean, carries on through probably throughout most of your career, I would think, oh, yeah. in terms of yeah. what had to be achieved. Yeah, exactly. The priority was let's do it and succeed. At the time, we started with one aircraft every four months. And then we were dreaming, dreaming. I remember my father going through the assembly line and saying, yes, and here we can eventually do four aircraft a month. Four aircraft a month. Four. Times have changed. <laughs> yeah. Okay, Barbara, we could carry on talking for hours, but we have to move on. Let's wander over to somewhere which I know has got some personal significance to you. We've just come from the coffee area and we're now standing outside the impressive glass-fronted Felix Kratz mock-up centre. Felix Kratz, one of the original Airbus pioneers and your father, Barbara. It, it exudes calmness, but I'm sure that's not the case inside where many deals are done 
on the table as customers, prospective airlines look at, at the product range there. But Barbara, what does it make you feel seeing your father's name up on, on the building there? Well, uh, of course, I'm very proud, uh, but I'd like to mention my father, of course, but also Roger Betay on the French side. I think one of the reasons for the success of Airbus is that these two people uh, met and worked together and had the same approach, which was put aside flags uh, Roger Betay had seen, was not directly involved, but had seen how the Concorde project was working with a lot of flags uh, on each side and each defending the national interests. My father had seen it on the Transal program and they had seen the nonsense of all that. And uh, when they met, there was a match between the two. Roger Betay was basically the technical father of the Airbus A300 and he had the, the will to bring it in forward in the most rational way and my father was the same and from a he was then in charge put in charge of the industrial organization the production and the idea was not to duplicate any any work so finished uh, two assembly lines like for Concord or three like for the Transal, there was just to be one and it was to be at the location which seemed the most reasonable and where you had to do the least investment. In Toulouse you had already two very long runways uh, you had all the test uh, facilities, you had uh, uh, comparatively free airspace for flight testing, so Toulouse was selected. And when you look at it, even today for the new programs, the basic principle remains the same. Let's take a walk inside the mock-up centre, Barbara. We're going to be walking past many uh, mock-ups of current aircraft range. The layouts give the airlines various options on what they can decide to choose for, for what they want to order. And it's quiet and calm in here now, but I'm sure there's some pretty frenetic meetings going on day to day with the airlines making those important decisions. And Barbara, we're looking at some pretty impressive uh, mock-ups here, but I imagine there was nothing like this when you started many years ago. Definitely not. Actually, where we are standing, it used to be um, a huge public gym and before we had orchards uh, at the entrance of the building uh, and in summer, uh, in spring, we would pick up cherries and uh, uh, in autumn plums uh, falling on the, car, on the cars parked underneath the, these nice trees. So it was very much countryside-like. Actually, you were talking about uh, sales negotiations and things like that happening uh, here in this uh, mock-up centre. In the early days, because there was no aircraft in service, basically we had to sell the products on the assembly line. And a lot of times, in particular my father, spent his time walking uh, potential customers through the assembly line, climbing into the aircraft to demonstrate how this was engineered and how that was engineered and how the uh, controls were segregated rather than put next one to each other, going into the hydraulic bay to show how uh, easily it was to maintain them or going into the electronic bay, how the assembly was done with 20th of a millimeter precision, how all that was organized. That's how we had to sell the product in the early days. Barbara, now we're sat just with uh, some of those impressive mock-ups behind us. You were talking about your father's um, origins just now, but what about your own? Were you always involved in aircraft? Uh, well, I had heard a lot of aircraft when I was uh, a youngster to the point that I was fed up with aviation. <laughs> and I wasn't very keen on uh, journalists either. Uh, but I was a student and uh, my father was, of course, involved with, uh, with Airbus and suggested I could be a hostess on the first Airbus uh, stand Airbus ever had at Le Bourget Air Show. Okay, it was good money at the time, 200 francs a day for a student, not bad. 
and uh, and I enjoyed it. And after that, apparently, I hadn't done too bad a job. Uh, they needed uh, someone uh, to escort uh, the A300 number one on a demo, demo tour to Latin America and North America in September, October 73. And because I spoke uh, all uh, four languages of Airbus, uh, French, German, English, and Spanish, uh, okay, it was thought I was useful. And uh, this is how eventually I, w I fell in love with aviation and started uh, with Airbus and applied for a job when Airbus moved to Toulouse. That experience must have been amazing on, on the first Airbus world tour. It was an incredible experience which would not repeat because we were not known, we were new, uh, there were no customers around the world so we were like a, a flying circus because we were self-sufficient. We had all the maintenance guys on board, uh, we, uh, the maintenance team, every uh, spare parts sent and on board the aircraft uh, to be self-sustainable. And what was the reception like when you landed in the different cities? Everybody is polite and interested and of course uh, you had a look and people came and we did demo flights. Yes, of course, we were welcome, but it was a bit of uh, curiosity. Uh, oh, these Europeans, uh, ah, yes, they are able to build a plane, but uh, let's see, uh, what are they going to do? Is it going to be a one-off like Caravel or like the Trident or, or the back 111 and they build a few and then they stop it and, and move on to something else? Coming back to yourself, Barbara, I mean, you said earlier you speak many languages and your early days in Airbus, you in some way, many ways, epitomize what Airbus stands for in terms of uh, a family and this cultural diversity that it has embedded within its DNA. In a way, yes, uh, I would say. I felt home at Airbus. Here we were creating really Europe and demonstrating what Europe can achieve when working together. And that was the objective also of the, of the fathers to over, uh, of Airbus, to overcome the past uh, and the past fights and to build something together. We have much better to do uh, by joining forces and being, and, and we can demonstrate that we can represent a strong force. The evidence is here today with what Airbus stands for on the world market. I mean, we talk in the company quite often about the Airbus family being the products, but also the people in it. And it sounds as though those origins started right from day one. Uh, definitely. It was the objective from day one to, to construct something, to integrate, despite all the rivalries. Of course, the partners were... I don't want to say fighting, but okay, defending their interests. But in the end, they had a common goal, which was the benefit of the program. And then they would end up comp compromising and finding a suitable solution. So Barbara, we'll, you, you brought along a picture today, which uh, we're looking at now, and it's the A340 coming into land with the Sacre Coeur, the Tour Eiffel, uh, in the background. Could you just describe what was going on in that image? Uh, that was at the end of the Le Bourget Air Show in 1993. Uh, it was a very quiet period. At the time, uh, there were no order announcements, nothing. And basically, uh, what we had decided to do during the show is to demonstrate the, uh, the value of the A340. The 340 was Airbus' first long-range plane. And with that plane, uh, we toured the world in, with just one single stop in Auckland. Uh, and uh, bre breaking five different types of records, uh, aviation records. And uh, on the picture, you see the aircraft coming back. It had uh, left Le Bourget on the Wednesday morning. On the Thursday, it was landing in Auckland with time difference. Departed Auckland uh, four or five hours later after having done a refueling and some... Uh, uh, checks and then flew back to land at 1 p.m., roughly 1 p.m., on time, on schedule, 
as planned uh, at Le Bourget. And here you see it arriving. It was really a very emotional moment. We did steal the show. It was fantastic. One of the highlights uh, which I can remember from my life at Airbus. So that's one great example, Barbara, and uh, there's been many others, I'm sure, but equally there must have been some challenging times through the years. Oh, yes, there have been. Uh, uh, I do remember vividly the early early 77, uh, when we lost uh, Western. Uh, It was the first potential North American customer for four plus four aircraft. But this came after a year where we hadn't had any sale and the mood was really, are we going to continue? There were discussions about stopping the program. So uh, the risk was very great for it to, for the program to be stopped. Luckily, it was not. Then we had another period uh, in the early 80s. It was the same. Uh, Very, very risky. And another very sad moment was uh, when we lost on 30th June uh, 74 uh, an A300 during a test flight. Uh, I think we learned a lot from that and also a bit of humility. Barbara, many thanks for your time today. It's been fascinating hearing about uh, the the site and your past and and that of the company and your father as well. And um, you've certainly lived up to your moniker of stirred but not shaken. Thank you very much for the opportunity. And uh, I say good luck to Airbus for the future and above all to keep that fighting spirit and startup spirit. Wow, Jeff, that's a fantastic story. I mean, I still remember when I met Barbara for the first time. It was probably in the early 2000s, and I was still a journalist. All I knew about her is was, at that time, that she was an icon in the world of Airbus, and now I understand why. What were your impressions? I mean, you even got to know her uh, for much longer than I did as, as a colleague in the company. Yes, I worked with her for a number of years, but saw a totally different side during the interview. I mean, the passion that she shows in talking about Airbus as a company, some of the characters, the pioneers that she worked with really came through. And her view of, yes, you can go grab it, you can do it, really holds true today. And it's something that took us to where we are. We wouldn't have got to 50 years without that. And I also like the fact that she talked about the Airbus family. It's something we talk a lot about in the company, whether it's our products or our people. But you can see that that really did start from day one, when those small number of people and pioneers really saw this vision of what Airbus could be, and that's where it all started. Indeed, it's very fascinating when we're talking about we are one today at Airbus. We all know now what it means. Uh, She actually embodies that. Thanks, Jeff. So that concludes this edition of the We Make It Fly podcast. If you've enjoyed it, please rate and review it. Don't forget to subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. You can follow us on all social media. Simply use the hashtag Airbus Podcast to get in touch with us. Give us your feedback. Whether it's good, bad, or indifferent, doesn't matter. We would like to know what you think. This program was made by Earshot Strategies. The executive producer is Richard Myron. Other production undertaken by Anug Mi. I'm Martin Aguera, and I was joined by Jeff Burridge today. Thank you for listening, and I hope you've enjoyed the journey. Thank you.